Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at the Kubernetes component overview. So what I'm gonna do is give you a top level simplification on a lot, but not all of them, but a lot of the Kubernetes components because there's just too many. It'd be uh, uh, too much to go through all of them, but these are all the ones that we are gonna be spending a lot of time with, uh, and you definitely will need to know them all. And you will know them all because we deep dive on a lot of these and you'll get to see them again and again and again in the course. So at the top of our list is the cluster. And this is a logical grouping of all the components within a cluster. So mostly everything that follows after this is generally inside of a cluster. There are some exceptions. Uh, the next is a namespace. So this is a named logical grouping of Kubernetes components within a cluster and it's used to isolate different workloads on the same cluster. I like to think of it as a slice of pie. So when you look at the icon, and I made all these icons, by the way, because I do not like the ones uh, that are uh, provided right now in the community. So I just made my own, but I made it look like a slice coming out of that cluster. So you can remember what that is. Uh, then you have nodes. So this is a virtual machine, or it could be a serverless container because some providers like Google and AWS lets you run it on their service container platform. But either way, it's just the underlying compute, the underlying server. And there are two types of nodes. We have control plane and worker nodes. So worker nodes is where your application or workloads run, and the control plane node manages worker nodes. So it does a lot of stuff like that. Then you have pods, and pods are the smallest unit in k 8 It's an abstraction over containers. It generally defines an application workload, but basically lots of these components are just pods. And I will see that again and again when we list out pods, because I list them all the time to show you under kubectl namespace uh, what is running. They're always pods. So the next is service. So a service is something that we use with a pod to give it a static I, I, uh, IP address or a DNS name uh, for a set of pods. So the idea here is that if a pod dies, because pods get um, dynamic IPs, but we want them to have static IPs. And so that's the purpose of a service. But the service is also utilized as a load balancer. And I'm going to point out that them calling this a service is really confusing because a lot of times a service, when we're talking about containers, means a workload or application that is continuously running. Right, so if you've ever used AWS uh, uh, ECS, uh, you have the option to run a task or a service, which are just containers and based on how long they run. But for whatever reason, that's what they wanted to name it. Uh, the, the CNCF decided to name it or Kubernetes project uh, named it. I don't think it's a great name, but that's what it is. Ingress is also not a great name, but that's a name they gave it. But Ingress is used to translate HTTPS rules to point to services. Uh, but what we'll really see is that it's commonly used, and this is the hardest component that we are going to learn throughout this course, but it's used for getting a load balancer, uh, like an external load balancer on AWS, GCP, Azure, to a uh, route traffic to our pods, okay? Then you have the API server. The API server allows users to interact with Kubernetes components using the kubectl, or by sending HTTP or S requests, probably put an S on there because probably everything uh, is encrypted in transit, uh, transit. I really doubt that they would have it so that it's just HTTP. And I like to think of the API server as the backbone of communication for Kubernetes. And you will see that uh, in a future diagram where it looks literally like, uh, like, um, like the backbone, okay? Uh, then there's kubelet. So kubelet is an agent installed on the nodes. Kubelet allows users to interact with a node via the API server and kubectl. And again, that is a simplification. It actually does more than that, but we will dig deeper into that. We have kubectl. It's a command line interface that allows users to interact with the cluster and components via the API server. So the CTL stands for, uh, I think, controller. And CTL is very, very common to put after a name for some kind of tool that's used for controlling things via a CLI. And we spend so much time, tons and tons of time uh, with the kubectl. So you will know kubectl inside and out by the end of this course. You have Cloud Controller Manager. This allows you to link a CSP, like AWS Azure GCP, to leverage cloud services. 
I uh, never had to provision one in throughout this course. I never even noticed one. I think like when you launch uh, a managed service, it's already there for you. And it replaces, I believe, the controller manager. Uh, but I'm just saying it's there, but we don't really ever have to think about it. So we have the controller manager, and this is a control loop that watches the state of the cluster and will change the current state back to the desired state. So it's basically state management, but it's also, uh, you could think of it as the brain of Kubernetes because it's doing all the controlling. Uh, we have a scheduler, so it determines where to place pods on nodes and places them in a scheduling queue. So that's why we have this little crane here because it's picking them up and putting them where they need to be. You have Cube Proxy, so an application on worker nodes that provides routing and filtering rules for ingress or incoming traffic uh, to pods. You have a network policy. These act as a virtual firewall. Uh, it, it says as, but at, <laughs> sorry, at the namespace level or the pod level. So it just um, uh, puts restrictions around how pods or namespaces, stuff in namespaces can communicate with each other because by default, everything it just can talk to everything in, it, within a cluster. Uh, you have config map. So this allows you to decouple environments uh, specific configuration from your container images so that your applications are easily portable. It's used to store non-confidential data in a key value pair. So this is just application uh, configuration uh, details, okay? Uh, then you have, I'm not sure why it's not showing up, there we go. Then you have a secret. So this is a small amount of sensitive data such as a password, a token, or key. It's basically config map uh, but with the option to encrypt it. Uh, then you have volumes. So volumes um, are basically, uh, well, there's some variations here, but uh, they're basically mounting storage. So locally on a node uh, or remote to cloud storage. Then you have stateful sets. We do not do stateful sets in this course because they are just too hard to do, uh, but we definitely talk about them in great detail. So these provide guarantees about the ordering and uniqueness of uh, the pods. So think of databases where you have to determine reads and writes in order or limit the amount of containers. Stateful sets are hard when you can host, use a, a database externally from the Kubernetes cluster. So like if you have a relational database, put it on RDS, right? Or put it on Cloud, Google Cloud Spanner. Uh, but safe, uh, stateful sets just basically give you a guarantee that you're gonna send traffic to a very particular pod. You have replica sets. So maintain a stable set of replica pods running at a given time. Uh, it can provide a guarantee of availability. Uh, so this is just saying like take a pod and run copies of it so that we have redundancy there. Uh, and we generally do, do not launch replica sets directly. We do them through a deployment. And this is also how pods are deployed. So deployments deploy a replica set and the replica set deploys pods. So a deployment is a blueprint of a pod. So think like an EC2 launch template or something that just templates up um, what should be launched.